Okay, Rabbi welcome tonight. We're going to talk about uh, the virtue of modesty. So when we talk about modesty, right, we're only really we're mainly talking about the ladies. Why is that? Because the virtue of modesty is especially right profound with the ladies more than the men. Where do we find this idea? By the way, it says in the Mary, one of the commentators on the uh, Talmud, says the Mary that the virtue of modesty is the most beautiful quality of a woman. Nothing beautiful like modesty. What does that mean? You know, you go to modern culture today, right? American culture, Western culture. So, you know, the, more, the less the lady wears, the, the, they think the better, the better she is. You know what I mean? The less she wears, you know, she's like almost naked guy, you know, whatever. No wear. That's considered to be good in, in Western culture. But in, in our culture, in the Jewish culture, just the opposite, right? The more she's covered, the more she's, right? Uh, like the, the more elegant she is, the more beautiful she is. The beauty is from... The beauty of the woman is to cover her private parts, you know, and also not so private as well, right? We have to talk about to understand what that means. Covered. So this is considered to be the most beautiful thing. What does that mean? Why? Why is it so beautiful, by the way? Beautiful. The modesty in a woman. What's the reason why? You know why? No. Because Kadosh Baruch Hu, right, the Creator, He made the woman with a beautiful, you know, body and face, right? They have beauty. They're much more better than they look much better than we do. Let's face it, right? We don't compare to them. Their beauty is much better than our beauty. But nevertheless, right, that beauty is for a purpose. What is the purpose of the beauty of the woman? You know? In Western culture, this is all corrupted. What does that mean? Right? They 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 utilize right uh, this the beauty of the woman for business, right, for profit. You know? They're basically making the woman into an item, you know, like uh, you know, uh, meat market, you know, meat market kind of thing. You know what I mean? They're turning her into a, a physical, right, uh, some kind of physical icon. Okay. That's what they do. For the sake of money, for the sake of pleasure, for the sake of enjoyment, all these things. This is a big corruption of what a woman is supposed to be. A woman is not supposed to be some kind of a, right, spiritual, uh, physical, you know, some kind of physical icon that everybody should be staring at and saying, well, you know, enjoying it and, you know, making like a public spectacle out of it. This is not the way it's supposed to be. You know, this is the corruption of Esav. They say, right, what is one of the big differences between Esav and Yaakov? You know what it is? How they how they look at women. So how do we look at women? You know the, the Jewish approach well, to looking at a woman. A woman is a princess, a queen. You know, in the family of the Jew, right? If it's a good Jewish family, the the woman is a princess there, a queen. What does that mean? We treat them with a lot of respect. You know why? Because the, the our ladies, the good Jewish women, yeah. they have a tremendous amount of kedusha, holiness. Okay. You know, and if you don't have the truth is, the Chazal tell us, right, if you don't have a woman in your house, mm-hmm. a good woman, you don't have any blessing in your home. You know, your home is without blessing. You know why? Because the holiness of the, our women is so great, the blessing comes through them. You know, they are the source of the blessing. The fact that they, right, uh, bring home the, these blessed customs, what does that mean? To act with modesty, to light the Shabbat candles, right, to, to dress modestly, to behave modestly, all these things, you know, it makes makes the house into a holy place, you know, holy shrine. That's what it does. The the woman transforms the home into a holy place, the holy 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 institution. But when you don't have a woman in the house, good woman, good Jewish woman, there's no blessing there, right? There's no happiness there. There's no there's no simcha. You cannot be happy like that just being by yourself. You know, Mr. Bachelor, you know? Boy, I'm uh, Mr. Bachelor. Have, there's no simcha like that. There's no, there's no happiness like that. But I'm a bachelor. So, you know what does that mean? Happy? That the, the we look at women as a blessing. You know, a spiritual blessing. All the blessing that we have in our family comes through them. The holiness influence of the family comes through them. What does that mean? That the Jewish women, they say, right, that the influence that they give in the family, the spiritual influence, this is what guides the family. This is what directs the family. So everybody gets influence from her, and they get directed on the proper path. She's the one who raises the children in the proper path. She's the one who directs her husband in the proper path. So it all depends on her, you know. She's a central role, central figure of the Jewish family. Everything comes from her. So now, right, regarding the beauty of the woman. So then what, what is the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu made them so beautiful like that? But it's not only beautiful, right? It's like, you know, it's more than beauty. It's just like, it's more like... You know, something which is a little bit provocative, right? You know, provocative. It's pro- so why why are they so provocative like that? Why do they look provocative? If you will see a woman 
who's not dressed properly, it's very provo- provocative, right? It's a uh, so why why is that? Yeah, What's the reason why they look this way? Because Hakadosh Baruch Hu made the world this way that women look this way. You know why? Because in order to have procreation, to have children, you need to have this uh, physical you know contact between the man and the woman. So this is something which is made for procreation. That you need this physical, you know, pleasure. You need this physical um, catal- catalyzer between the man and the woman, the beauty, the attraction. You need all this in order to create a new child and to bring a new soul into the world. You know why? Because you cannot bring the new soul into the world just by bringing a soul. You have to bring a body also, a physical body, right? We we're the ones who create the body by you know doing what we do with our spouse. But Kadosh Baruch Hu provides a soul. He's the one who gives a soul, right? So we're partners, right? They say, right? The, the partners in creation of the children are the husband, the wife, and God, right? Hashem. So what does that mean? You need all these elements. But also, since we have a physical body in a child, so therefore you need also physical attraction, that physical, you know, catalyzer that is between a man and a woman, which is something, right, has to be kept in the dark. It has to be kept, you know, modest, in a modest manner. Why is that? Because if you look, if you, if you parade it around, some kind of a sideshow, you know, show everybody. This is a corruption of, of the whole concept of what Judaism is all about. It's not about making money out of it or business out of it. What is it all about? About making a holy family and having beautiful children, right? So everything has to be kept modest. Once you once you put it out in the open and display for everybody to watch, right? Whether you're displaying it on Facebook, you right? Can. Or as we, as we said, right? Facebook or some Live. websites or whatever, right? Whatever it is you're displaying it or, or in some park over there, right? On the right, Yellowstone, or whatever, right? All these places. This is not the way. This is not the way of the Jewish people. The way of the Jewish people is to use this catalyzer, this physical catalyzer of the man and woman together. This attraction, this physical attraction is, is only for the purpose of making children. Boing. So when you're using it for another purpose, this makes HaKadosh Baruch Hu very, very angry. He gets very angry when you do this. They say, right, the Chazal say, nothing makes HaKadosh Baruch Hu angry like illicit relations with women. This is the most, nothing makes him more, more he, he burns, HaKadosh Baruch Hu burns with wrath, right? When he sees that illicit relations are going on in the Jewish, especially in the Jewish world, you know, between men and women, all kinds of things, or men and men, or women and women, doesn't make any men difference. Right? That's all, it's all the same. When you have illicit relations, racial relationships going on, Nothing angers HaKadosh Baruch Hu more than that. And that's why he punishes very severely for that. When there's illicit relations, right? Whatever it is, all these other, uh, all the things that we mentioned, whether it's uh, going with a, right, having relations with a Goy or a Goya or, or, you know, man and man, woman and woman, all these things. When he sees these illicit relations going on, prostitution, Zanut, right? Uh, all these kinds of things. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gets incensed with that. You know why? Because he made this physical catalyzer of the beauty of the woman only for procreation. Because it's a mitzvah. One of the greatest mitzvot in, in the Torah is to prove to procreate, to have children. So you're taking that you're taking that uh, mitzvah and you're turning it into a, some kind of a cheap, dirty, filthy business. You know, some kind of a cheap opportunity to make a buck. Nothing angers the Kadosh Baruch Hu more than that. This is the way it is, you know. Nothing, nothing makes them more incensed. They say, right, that when this happens that it becomes rampant, you know, illicit relations amongst the Jewish people. You know what happens? Andre la musia bala olam. You know what that means? Comes to the world like a lot of death, a lot of, you know, a lot of tragedies. And it kills even righteous people. You know, not only wicked die, only so the righteous die. You know why? Because it, it doesn't discern anymore. Once you get into this mode of Andre la musia, which is like total, you know, no, no, right, like total anarchy. You know, it's like a spiritual anarchy. Not, nothing, no control anymore. So what happens is that once we get to that level, people start to get harmed and die, even people who are righteous. You know why? Because that, that destructive power, the destructive angel that comes to kill people in that situation, doesn't discern between the righteous and the wicked. So therefore, right, it's considered to be a very dangerous thing, illicit relations that are rampant, um, especially amongst the Jewish people, right? Which are, who are the chosen people. So all these things are very, very dangerous. You know, a person has to know that all all the beauty of the woman is only for that purpose, for procreation. So therefore, don't now, when a person, what happens is that when a woman uses it for other purposes, you know, she wants to display herself to get attention or to get, you know, to get compliments, 
or all kinds of things in the street, you know, go out and parade herself. So all these things are considered to be very, very sinful, very, very dangerous, these kinds of things. This is the idea, you know. So a person has to know, this is why the virtue of the woman, the biggest virtue is modesty. You know why? Because with the men, it's not like that. We're not so, we don't look so good anyway, you know, as, as the women do. We don't have that provocative, you know, beauty that the, that the, that the women have. Right? The women have something very special. So therefore, the man is, is also commanded regarding sinut, regarding modesty. But the main, the main virtue is by the women. Why? Because the man can walk around in the street, let's say, with, right, with shorts and a t-shirt. That's considered to be uh, fine. According to Allah, there's no problem with that. You know? Goes with shorts, he puts on some sneakers, he puts on a t-shirt, he's considered to be uh, fine. You know? But a woman cannot walk around this way. Right? Not the same thing. You know why? Because the body of the woman has provocative elements in there. Right? What do we well, call that? What do we call those provocative elements? The, the, the Gemara in Masechet Brachot calls that erva. What is erva? That means nakedness, right? Provocative nakedness, nudity, right? Uh, uh, this kind of thing, right? So when it comes to these things, the Talmud teaches over there in the Masechet Brachot, there are certain parts of the woman that are erva. When it comes to the man, the only part that he's not allowed to display, really, is the genitals, the genital area. You know what I mean? He's, he has to cover that. But in terms of his chest or legs, wife, that's right? The, when he sees the girl, and it goes crazy. <laughs> when, it, when, it, when it comes to his chest or shoulders or, or, or you know, his legs, there's no prohibition to, to, to go around, right, like that in the street. Uh, there, there's no, halakhically speaking, there's no prohibition. Right? So same, not the same thing with men and women. But when it comes to women... There's a lot of things which are provocative. You know why? Because their 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 nature of the woman's body is is in, in essence provocative. That's what it is. So what does that mean? It tells the Gemara that there are certain things like parts of the body of the woman that are provocative. Number one, right? It says that tefach ish beisha be'erva. What does that mean? Tefach. That means uh, like this, right? About ten centimeters, eight centimeters, ten centimeters. If she shows that much of her body, right, whether it's a chest or the back, uh, right, or her uh, shoulders, things like this, if she shows that much, tefach, she's considered to be have nakedness, you know. Short, uh, short shirt, but only five inches. So, uh, the, any, anywhere on her body, more or less, right, we're going to discuss that, where, where we're talking about precisely, but if she, shows, if she shows anywhere on her body that much crease, right, that much nakedness, it's considered to be like she's naked. What about sandals? You know? And this is, this is, we're going to talk about that, but this is considered to be from the Torah, this prohibition. That's what the Paskim say, right? Rabbein Rabbein Maran, he says, he writes in his books that when a woman shows a tefach, this much nakedness on her body, that's already considered to be a prohibition from the Torah. It's not from the rabbis only. The, 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 the Torah also forbids that. That's the idea. So, therefore, right, a woman has to cover her body and not, there should not be anyone on her chest or shoulders or back or right the legs. We're going to discuss the legs as well. Right, there should not be one tefach, ten centimeters, eight centimeters exposed in one place. It's about ten centimeters. That's the idea, right? Eight centimeters, whatever. That's the idea, right? If she, if, if it's exposed, you're not allowed to look at that part. The truth is that the Gemara says over there is something even stronger. <laughs> you're talking to me about tefach, right? Eight centimeters, you know. But I'll tell you, even 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 the smallest amount. What does that mean? That if a person looks at a woman's pinky even, right? Her pinky, which is very small, the smallest finger that she has. Nevertheless, if he's looking at it to get pleasure, that's also forbidden. Right? And what does that mean? That he just wants to check it out. He has no he has no intention to marry her or to date her, you know, to, to see if she they're they're compatible. No. She he just wants to, you know, check her out for enjoyment. They say even if you look at a small pinky like that. Consider it to be like already enough to go to Gainam, to go to Gainam, to go to purgatory for that. Right? That's the idea. Because you're, you're looking at it just to enjoy it. So therefore, right, it's considered to be Erva. This is the idea. So all the more so if it's a Tefach, right? That's from the Torah already. Something even, even, more, even more profound. So what does that mean? That a woman is allowed to have her hand exposed. She doesn't have to cover her hand. But if you're looking at her hand for enjoyment... And you have no purpose for that. You have no intention to marry her or something like that to get the uh, right to to check the compatibility, whatever. Mm-hmm. There's no reason for you to look at her anywhere on her on her body, anywhere at, on her, at her face, at her fingers, or anywhere in her body. Oh, but when it comes to the, the the laws of nakedness, 
A woman is allowed to show parts of her hands. Her hands, she's allowed, she's allowed to show until right the elbow. Right? She has to cover. Why is that? Because the zroa, right, which is the, the the upper arm, is a problem. You know, that's nakedness. That's what the Gemara tells us, right? So therefore, you have to cover the the zroa, right? The upper arms over here until the elbow, and the elbow has to be covered as well. After the elbow, if this is uncovered, the forearm is considered to be okay. But comes and says to Mary that even if a woman, right, even if a woman, uh, even though a woman is allowed to uncover this part of her arm, the forearm, and her hands, nevertheless, it's a, it's also mitzvah to cover those two. In other words, it's considered to be the beauty of the woman. The more satsanua she is, the more mada she is, the more virtuous she's considered to be, and more beautiful. According to the viewpoint of the Torah. That's, that's the viewpoint of the Torah. That's the idea, you know? So this is something amazing, right? Which is just the opposite of Western culture. So Western culture, you know, has polluted, right, this concept very much and distorted, <coughs> twisted, <coughs> out of proportion, <coughs> this, this whole thing. You know? So we live amongst the these, you know, people who are dressing very, very inappropriately. And we have to know, right, that we have to be just on the other side. If they're on this side, we are just all the way on the other side, and we cannot, you cannot mingle with them. We cannot mingle, mingle their, our minds with them, our ideas with them. We have to keep our right, guard and, and guard our our, uh, our laws and traditions regarding modesty. So again, right, the Gemara says that shok beisha erva. What does that mean? That also the thigh of the woman is considered to be also erva. The thigh, right? So therefore, anything which is a, 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 above the shin has to be covered by the woman, right? She cannot expose that part. You know, like mini skirts, these kinds of things. Not allowed to wear those. Oh, sure. Because above above the shin is always considered to be, right, erva. The regarding below the shin, there is a machloket, right? There are some poskim who say that below the shin also should be covered, right? So there are some poskim who say below the shin doesn't have to be covered, the knees, right? If, if the knees have to be covered or not. So there are two opinions. So the truth is, right, that uh, the custom amongst the religious Jews is to cover that part too. What does that mean? They cover it with stockings. You know what I mean, uh, that's something else. But talking about men, right? You're talking about men more. But they cover it with stockings. They cover it with pantyhose, whatever it is, right? These kinds of things. So what's the halacha? The halacha is right. The custom amongst religious Jews is that they cover the thigh with um, with a skirt or a dress, right? And then below the thigh, when it comes to the uh, uh, when it comes to the, the knees, so there they cover it with some kind of. Uh, uh, non-clear, right? Um, substance, stack. right? Right, exactly. Colored, something colored, which you cannot cannot see through. If it's see-through, doesn't help you the fact that she covers it, because you can see through it anyway. It's clear, right? So if it's clear, it's clear. No good. It has to be something which is colored enough or thick enough that you can't see through it. That's the idea, right? Painted, it's, right? Whatever, painted, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, that's that's the idea. So uh, as we said again, right? That uh, here we find. There's also another part in the Gemara that says, right, Se'ar Beisha Erva. What does that mean? The hair also of the woman is Erva. Considered to be like that. Provocative. Why is that? Since the hair of the woman is so beautiful and it makes her, you know, the beauty of the woman is a, is a hair. She doesn't have nice hair. She doesn't look so great, right? Uh, you know, you know how it is, right? It's like the Arabs do that. Once they, right? once they, once they shave their head, the women, they don't look so nice. You know? Yeah, Unless she's very beautiful. But usually a woman without hair doesn't look so nice. You Isn't know what I mean? the same thing? Like the like the, the Muslims, they right? But you know, you know, you know what it is, right? We don't we don't want to discuss it. we don't want to discuss other religions. We're not here to but discuss the same, them. It comes you know? from the same. It's thought. not really the same thing. You know why? Because the their 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 religion is man-made. Ours is from God. So you have to follow the guidelines of Judaism, not to twist, you know, shift to other religions and compare. You know, why? What do they do? What do they? Who cares what they do? You know, let them do whatever they want to do. That's not our business. Our business is to do what what God tells us to do, not what they do and the, they show on the internet or whatever. You know, uh, God knows whatever it is. Right, these people. They, In the street, these, uh, right? them, say, hey, sister, how you we're not gonna we're not gonna <laughs> we're not gonna learn our religion from man-made you know, sources, right? Our religion has to be, has come from God. So this, therefore, this is this is the reason, right? We don't compare our notes with them. We don't care about them. We have no business with them. Let them do whatever they want to do. That's okay. their business. We're gonna do what what Hashem wants us to do. That's the that's the idea. So, regarding also the, the, the hair as well, it says, right, They're saying you shave the head? Yeah, the what woman? about it? The yeah. woman? Oh, that's why she wears the wig. Yeah, you don't have to shave the head. The truth is, you know, this is like a, sort of a extreme measure, you know? But they wear a wig, right? Wear right, but, you know, this is like already not... So not, they all look the same. This is not according to the Torah law. This is like a... 
Like communal, you know, they have some communal cults. They're cults that do, do communal cults. Nice hairdo, honey. Yeah, nice hairdo. <laughs> They're both the same. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. okay, so you got the idea. So what we're saying is like this, right? That uh, the, the, since the beauty of the woman is the hair, therefore the hair also has to be covered, right? What does that mean? For that, from the Torah, once a woman is married, she has to cover her hair. This is the idea. But when it comes to single women, right, even though the truth is that there are many poskim who say that single women also should cover their hair, but the custom is not like that now, nowadays, right? The, the later authorities say, custom nowadays, in, in almost all the communities, is that the young girls who are not married do not cover their hair until they get married. That's the way it is, right? This is the universal, pretty much the universal, universal custom today. There were some places, like in the Arab countries, where since the custom was over there to cover, everybody used to cover or whatever, so therefore even the single girls used to cover in the Arab countries. We're talking about the Jews, right? Uh, they used to, because that was a oh, culture over there. That oh, was, yeah. that was, that was, you know, in order to adapt with the culture, they used to cover their hair, even the, even the single girls. But the truth is, right, that nowadays in most places, you're not going to find single girls who cover their hair. Usually their hair is exposed, and there is what to rely on, right? There are poskim who say that it's allowed for several reasons and so forth and so on. And also, the truth, truth is, we don't want we want them to look nice. That they, and that they should, in order they should get married, you should find the shidduch, right? To find the, to find a suitable marriage mate. So we want them to look nice, right? It says in the uh, it says in the Gemara that a father who has a girl who's grown up already, and she's you know mar- marriageable age, so it's a mitzvah for him to make her look nice, you know, in order that they should want to marry her. You know, she should dress yeah. nice and be be nice, you know, look good. She should look good, not provocative. But she should look nice, you know. Why is that? Because we want her to get married, you know, uh, not to for her to wait around uh, until she's you know 28 years old, 30 years old, and 25, 35, and 40. Cover up, you know, cover right? Up. That's that, that's the idea, you know. <laughs> cover it up. That, that's that's the idea. So therefore, right, when it comes to younger girls, there certainly is what to rely on, and that is the custom that uh, the younger girls who are not married, uh, the single girls, uh, they do they don't they don't cover their hair. Now, when it comes to um, what about divorced women and almana, right? Uh, widows. So, they get so there, the rabbis made a decree that they should also cover their hair. You know why? Because even though right now they are not married, but since they were married at one time, so therefore, right, they, they thought that if they would not cover their hair, so there would be a mistake made over there. They would say, oh, you know, this lady's married, she doesn't cover her hair, it would make like a mistaken impression. Right, I, you know? So therefore, they made a decree that also the divorced women and the uh, the, uh, the widows right, should should also cover their hair. So therefore, rabbinically speaking, right from the rabbis, the law is that a woman who's divorced or widowed has to cover her hair. I was just asked recently, right, uh, regarding um, there are some ladies like this, you know, who are divorced and widowed, and they want to remarry, you know. So the question is. Are they allowed to uncover their hair? Be attractive. To, you're right, to be attractive, exactly. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, that's the idea. So the truth is that we find one opinion regarding that, right? Moshe Feinstein, Shalom, he writes in Igot Moshe, his book, Igot Moshe. He writes over there that a woman who's divorced or widowed and she wants to find a new mate, so she is allowed to uncover her hair in order for that purpose. You know what I mean? Even though the, the custom is to cover the hair, but nevertheless, since she wants to find a suitable mate for herself, Remarry, she shouldn't stay around like without without any without a husband. So therefore, in order to remarry, she's allowed to uncover her hair for that purpose. What does that mean? Even even if she's not on a date, but she's let's say let's say she goes to work, right? But she has a she works in an office, and there there, there are some men there that she's interested in. You know, maybe that they like her. So if she wants to look look nice for them, then or they should be attracted to her. So therefore, they um, that's what they do. Okay. Understand? Yeah. That's the idea. So. Uh, therefore, it is allowed, but the truth is that most of the poskim, most of the authorities do not allow that. They don't allow a woman who is widowed or divorced to go without a head covering altogether, especially outside. We're talking about outdoors, right? We're not talking about indoors, because indoors, a woman doesn't have to cover her hair, according to Allah. According to Allah, according to Shulchan Ruch, according to Talmud, a woman doesn't have to cover her hair in the house. She only has to cover her hair when she's outside. What about the body? Out, in, what does that mean? In, in the public domain. But right? the, body, the, the body, yeah, she has to cover. Yeah, in the, house. in the house, depends on the situation. I mean, you know, she can't be covered all the time, obviously. She can't be vacuuming naked. You know what I mean? 
Get rid of, you gotta get rid of those thoughts. <laughs> well, if she wants to be yes, doing I'm sorry. that yes. with her husband alone, yeah. nobody can say, nobody can object. Yeah, you're right. The truth is, you know, no. Technically speaking, technically speaking, there is no pro there is no prohibition in the house, but there is one issue there, right? Which is that what? If, if, let's see if the husband wants to pray. Hi, hi. Join us. Have a seat. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, we're getting all kinds of interesting visitors lately. Who is he looking for? A rubber place? <laughs> Dangerous characters. Right? Okay. My gun here. okay, you should, you should. Okay, bring it next time. Next time, bring it apart. Right, so as we said, uh, in, in, when it comes to indoors, the truth is that she can dress the, the way she wants in her home, but there is an issue there, which is that what? If the, if the husband wants to pray in the house, right? Or he wants to say Kiyat Shema, so he can't look at her when she's naked, you know? Right. So he has to either like close his eyes or turn around. Or put her you know what I mean? He's got to make sure he's not looking at her, you know, when he's praying. Like that. So, you know, you have to, you have to know how to deal with these things. That's the way it is, right? So, you know. I like the way you clean uh, the house. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe more kids. <laughs> okay, it's okay. We we'll make kids. Naughty boy, naughty boy. Well, uh, you're, you're, you're telling me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, as we said, when it comes to right, the divorced woman or almana or the widow, so what we say is like this, right? That. According to that posek, Ramosha Feinstein, they're allowed to under, uncover their hair altogether for that reason. But according to the others, they give like a better, more practical solution, which is like more, you know, realistic. What is that? That they should put on a wig. You know what I mean? They should right. put a shaitel, they should put a wig on, and this way, right, they, they can look attractive, because the wigs today look very good. Biggie they're wigs. very stylish. Some, sometimes they look even better than the real hair, you know? Yeah. Many they're times. Flip yeah, they're beautiful. They're gorgeous. I mean, they're you like that? works of art. These, 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 these wigs are beautiful. They're gorgeous. So therefore, there's no reason to uncover the hair altogether. So what they can do is uh, to put on one of these shaitos, one of these wigs. They can go out and, you know, try to find somebody, you know, a new guy, whatever, to marry, whatever. Some, do their thing. Right, do their thing, right, exactly. That, that's, that's the whole idea. So this is the way it is regarding the, the, um, the, 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 the hair. Now regarding what? There's also another one which is said over there in the Gemara. Masechet Brachot. Right, kol isha erva. What does that mean? The voice of the woman is also considered to be, right, uh, provocative. You know? So, what does that mean? That a person is not allowed to listen to a woman singing if she's inside, if he's in the same room with her. Why? Because if he sees her singing, he's going to get attracted to her. You know. So, we we have a solution for that. But you know what the solution is? The solution is that if you look, if you listen, if you're listening, to, let's say to a to an album, you know, whatever, and you're listening to a woman sing, so since she's not with you there, it's okay. You know? The prohibition is only when she's there. You know what I mean? That's the idea. So if, if she's there in the same room with you, you shouldn't listen to her sing. You know why? Because a, a woman's voice is provocative. That's the same idea. Right? So a person has to be careful about that. But there, there, are, there are ways to get around these things sometimes, you know, depending on the situation. Nevertheless, right, um, there's also another thing that we learn from here, right? That because it says, Koli Sha'erva, the voice of the woman is, is considered to be, to, be, to be provocative. So therefore, one of the things about modesty of the woman is that she shouldn't be too loud with her voice, you know, screaming out. Public, you know, ah, I'm screaming. Well, what are you screaming about? You know, a woman should be, you know, respectable. What does that mean? Not to scream, not to yell, to get too much attention. You know what I mean? A woman has to has to be respectable. So this is one of the things. You know, tzniut is right. Modesty is not only the way you dress; it's also the way you behave. You know, behave like a classy woman, elegant woman. What does that mean? Elegant woman, respectable. You know, not too loud, not too, you know, flirtatious. Also, you know what I mean? Being flirtatious also is considered to be a very bad thing. You know, talking too much to men. That's how everything starts. Everything starts with a conversation. You know, that's that's the where really these things begin. That's the way it is, right? And also, right, regarding this kind of thing, the Chazal tell us, by the way, you should know, Halacha says that if a, if a person has a wife like that, who doesn't dress modestly, and doesn't behave modestly, she goes swimming with men, you know, in the same pool, you know, on the beach, she goes swimming with men, all kinds of things like this, it's a mitzvah to divorce her. Right? Try to get rid of her. 
Why is that? Because this kind of woman is going to come to do some bad things, right? You know how it is, right? One thing leads to another. So the person has to know, right, that when you have a wife like this, you have the wrong, you're with the wrong lady. Yeah, you got to find a lady who's modest, who's respectable, who's going to give you a good family, right? Respectable family, Jewish family, holy family. If you have one of these uh, floozy girls, you know what I mean? Excuse the expression, right? You're going to have, you're going to be having, you know, I'll tell you, be honest with you, a person who has a wife like this, he's going to wind up probably getting sick also. You know how, right? it's how nervous people get and always the, the suspicion and all kinds of things like this. You know, you have like uh, impact, impact, you know, that's, yeah. uh, that's what happens to a person like that. It was a wife like that. So, therefore, right, the Chazal tell us that you should not, uh, you have, if, you have, if a person has a wife like this, doesn't want to dress modesty, take her to the bed din, right, give her a get and tell her bye-bye, God bless you, you know, God all the best to you, right, I want to get a different wife, you know, because I'm not interested in my house that should be like this, you know, some kind of a, excuse the expression, right? You know, we know what I'm talking about. Oh, wow. All the more so, a person shouldn't marry somebody like that, right, in the first place. What does that mean? If you see a woman who doesn't dress modestly, don't marry her. Either convince her to dress modestly, if you can. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. Whatever, right? Every situation is different. But if you can't convince her, right, tell her, I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm looking for a woman who dresses according to Jewish law. Marry the girl that's not This is the idea, you know? A person has to know that. This is, so what does that mean? When it, comes to, when it comes to women, modesty is a deal breaker. You know what I mean? Because the, the main virtue of the Jewish woman is modesty. If she doesn't have that, nothing will nothing nothing will flourish from there. Nothing there's gonna be no blessing from a marriage like that. Only only bad will come out of it. The truth is, you know, that what I'm telling you now applies to somebody who's somewhat religious himself. But if he if he himself also is not religious, so you know, what are we gonna tell him? Well, divorce your wife. He's also messed up, you know what I mean? So if they're both messed up, they belong together in a sense, you know what I mean? So I mean what are we gonna tell him, you know? Divorce your wife. So he's going to bring another one like her. What is it going to help? So what we're, what we're talking about is a person who's observant regarding these things, you know? Who has, who, has, who has the scruples. He has the morals. So if he has these scruples and morals, then he knows what's halakha. He knows what's Jewish law. So he shouldn't marry a woman like that. And if he, if he has somebody like that, who, you know, degenerated like this, a woman who, you know, does these all kinds of tricks like this, you know? Like David mentioned, right? In the park over there, Yellowstone, whatever. All kinds of things like this. If a person has a wife like that, what should he do? Don't have don't have mercy on her and try to you know like uh, you know try to kind of you know like just go divorce. You know, first you take her you take her to a, to a rabbi, sit down with the rabbi. You know, the rabbi. This is the situation. Okay, so the rabbi will tell her right. Okay, you're gonna change. Are you gonna start dressing modestly or behaving modestly? If she says no, we we try maybe with a, with a bed din. We try to go to a court, right? Jewish court, whatever. You can't convince her. She's she wants she's adamant about her ways. She wants to be like that. So what we say is, right, write you a nice get, right, and say bye-bye, right? Call to, all the best, right? Enjoy yourself. Have a good life. That's the idea. Why is that? Because modesty, when it comes to women, is a deal-breaker. They say, by the way, Chazonish used to say, al Shalom, that modesty is really a, um, also an indicator. In other words, if you don't know the, the character of a woman, right, who she is, what she is, you know how you find out? How she dresses, Right? If you see the way she dresses, if she dresses modestly, in a respectable manner, so then you know she's a respectable person. So if you want to marry a woman, right, how do you know if she's a God-fearing person? By the way she dresses. You know why? Because the main virtue of the woman is, is, is her modesty. If you see that she's not respectable, the way she dresses, very flashy, you know, very flamboyant, you know what I mean? Sleazy, you know? Don't marry a woman like that. This is not the woman to marry. This one is actually in that respect of chameleon because she's not yeah, always dressed, dressed up. up. I was thinking of that too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk, talk to you about that. That's a different it's issue, but you know, since we're on the air, I don't want to get into this now. So uh, right, to get into the private, the private issues, right, the personal issues. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> to avoid embarrassing anybody, you know. Don't tell anybody, Robert. Right, exactly. So uh, anyway, the point is like this, right? That uh, when you see a woman who's modest, says the Chazonish, that shows you that she's God fearing. What does that mean? She'll provide for you a home which is a holy home, a Jewish home, a kosher home. But if she dresses like, you know, Lord. you know, the floozy, the floozy way, you know, excuse my expression, you know what that's going to be, right? Your house is also going to be a floozy house. That's what it's going to be. That's, the, that's what you're going to get. 
pay yeah. and a half a shirt. So a person has to know that, right? Sometimes, by the way, you can convince them. You know, you can tell the lady, listen, you know, no. I'm, a, I'm a religious guy. You know, I'm a Jewish guy. You know, are you, do, you do, are, do you agree to dress, you know, in a modest way? At least when you go outside and we go outdoors, at least that much. Can you agree to that? So if she agrees to that, then no problem. You know, she agrees, she agrees. You know, the, you can convince her, you can convince her. You know, but if she doesn't agree, and she just sticks to her ways, and you see, right, she's, uh, you know, where, crafty, you know, one of these crafty the ones. Top. Tricky ones, you know, over like, you know, top, right? tricky, tricky girl, you know, like those girls, you know what I'm talking about, right? So if she's one of those tricky ones, you got to watch out for them. Be careful, right? Don't, don't play games. Lay off. That's the idea. So Rabbi as we said, right, that a person doesn't know a woman's character, look at the way she dresses, right? Also, another thing, this is the side of right, which is, if you want to know if she's god as we said, look at the way she dresses. What about if you want to know if she's a good person, she's, she respects her husband, she's going to be respectful to her husband, she's not going to be arrogant to her husband, she's not going to be, right, uh, you know, very uh, Rabbi, rebellious against Rabbi, her husband. How do, you, how do you see that? Rabbi, I can't find one dressed or undressed, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pray for you, we'll, we'll pray for you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, you know what the husband said, right? How do you know if she's going to respect your husband, her husband? You don't know who she is. So, you know what he said? Look at the way she treats her parents. If she treats her parents with respect, for sure she'll treat her husband with respect as well. This is a very psychologically a very deep thing. You know why? Because since the parents are her authority figure before she gets married, so therefore, right, the same thing, now when the husband becomes her authority figure after that, she's going to treat them the same way as she, her husband as the way she treat her parents. You know why? Because she's switching now authority figures. She's going from the parents and switching over to a husband. So since now, right, the roles are being switched from the parents to the husband, so therefore the same treatment that the parents got is going to be treatments that the husband gets. So therefore, the Chazanish used to say, right, if you want to see a woman, what she's really made of, right, um, how, do you, how do you find out? These two things, right? How does she dress? Does she dress modestly? Does she behave modestly? And also, does she treat her parents with respect? If she has these two qualities, says the Chazanish, for sure this is a good girl. Worthwhile to invest in her, right? Good investment. That's the idea. Right? Very, great, very smart, very smart words of the Chazanish. You know what I mean? A person has to know, by the way, that this is the this is the way. This is the way of the Jewish people. Modesty is a very, very important, important thing. Very crucial. You know, they, they say that they say the the, uh, the Chazal that when there's no modesty amongst the Jewish people, amongst Jewish women, they dress, you know, very like this, you know, very provocatively. What happens is that it, it removes the divine presence from the Jewish people, right? It, it, it takes away the divine presence, the Shekhinah. Departs from us. Why is that? Because it's considered to be a very grave offense. What do they do with the bathing suit when they go to the beach? Good question. You know what I mean? What do you say, it David? It be the bikini, but it has to be... David, what do you say about that? You, you, you're showing more than five inches. <laughs> okay. I honestly don't think that uh, they belong on the beach. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Slave. okay. Right? The truth is, you know, that... Well, what does that have to do with slavery? I don't think your, your wife... Because like you're slavery. preventing somebody from, from her free will. Free what? Free will. <laughs> what are you talking about? Is that what she wants to do? What business, so okay. what, what business does a wife have? She, well, she wants to go to the beach. To go to the beach and to put on a bikini for other men to be looking at her. Well, what about a fool? Suit thing. You know, you know what the rule is regarding this, to be honest with you, Robotai. Regarding swimming, you know, this kind of thing, right? Um, that uh, the, the the women are not allowed to swim with the men. No? Right. They're not they allowed to swim. can't pray with the men either, so it's the right? same thing. Yes, yes. Even all the more so, right? Swimming is even more dangerous, right? Obviously. Because they're not <laughs> they're not dressed, you know, whatever. Except playtime. Right? Playtime, you know what I mean? So <laughs> since it's playtime, the Yatsahara is more and more dangerous over there. But the truth is, right, that there are in Israel, Baruch Hashem. We have beaches, you know, that are separate from men and women. Separate beaches. Oh, really? Yeah. This is the women's I, beach. I this is the men's beach. In Israel, this is very common. They have it almost, almost everywhere. This, this kind of thing. So if it comes to a beach like that, it is permitted for women to go to a beach like that. Separate beach. But even there, you know, there's, there's, a, there's one problem there. The ocean. Yeah, yeah, the beach, yeah. There's, there's one problem there. You know the problem is? Sometimes the lifeguard is a man. So if the, if the lifeguard is a man, there has, there has to be a lifeguard there. So the same problem, you know? So if the lifeguard is a man, Maran used to tell us, the woman is not allowed to go to a woman's beach, even if it's a lady's beach. But if the lifeguard is a man, it's not allowed to go there. Same, same problem, you know what I mean? 
uh, because of the, there are there was there was one other rabbi actually who permitted this because they said you know what the life, lifeguard is working now he's not concentrating on you know the beauty of the woman that's not his intention right now his intention is to save right, lives. right save lives and this kind of the truth is you should know that it's not really accurate this thing because that. you know how it is right these lifeguards what are they doing they have binoculars and they're checking out the girls oh, yeah. you know you know how it is right Look, I don't have to tell you women are not supposed to, you know, we're not even supposed to dance together. Right, for sure, yeah. Okay, for sure. No dancing? For sure. So why would your, not together. Why would your w- woman be permitted to go on a beach practically naked right. in front of other men? Sure. I mean, come on. Yeah, that's no, there's no question about that. I mean, nobody keeps this except religious people, but still, you know. <laughs> well, I saw a picture with the uh, the, the muzzies in, in the water full with their full clothes on. Right, right, yes. In the yes, water. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I don't know what muzzies girls. are. I don't know what muzzies are. But. It was about, in Muslims. So it was about okay. ten, 10 girls. <laughs> 10 Muslims, fully thing with okay. the burqa and everything, but in the water. I got you. Okay. We'll see as the rise. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know that net designation. I'm sorry. That was, that was the first yeah, yeah, the muzzies. The muzzies. So, Matai, like as we said, said, right? It's called muzzy. It's the same as saying spit. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I got you. I got you. I got you. So as, as we said, Rabbi these are right the, the most virtuous things that when it comes to a woman, it's new. This is the number one number one issue. So therefore, right, if a woman has that, they say by the way, the Gaon of Vilna says something very deep about this. You should know what's what's the depth of the, of, the, of this issue, right? That women are different than men. Chazal tell us right that these are like two different nations, two different creations. Men and women are not the same mentality. They don't have the same, you know, mindset at all, right? So what does that mean? So it says the Gaon Mivina, who's closer, right? The two, out of the two two genders, right? Who's closer to the Yitzhara? What do you say about that? I would say women. Yeah, women are closer, right? You know that. To where? To so the the, the Yitzhara means the evil side, the evil inclination. Oh, so you think where women are? Who's closer? Who's closer to women that? Evil? Who, who is closer? Oh, be evil too. I don't right, but who's closer in nature? Uh, well. Women are. How do, where do you see that, by the way? You know where you see that? No. They say, right, that uh, in the Torah it says regarding a, a sorcerer, right? Yeah? Which? Right. So, you know, in according to the Torah, sorcery is not allowed. But well, what's the Kabbalah? Right? Kabbalah is not sorcery. It's mystic, mystic, Jewish mysticism, <laughs> right? Torah. Kabbalah is Torah, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Right, sorcery is from the evil side, you understand? Kabbalah is from the good side. That's the difference. So, uh, so that's used for curing people or getting the devil out of Yeah, it can be used yeah, for all kinds of things. But Exorcism? No, interesting thing like this, right? That uh, women are closer to the evil side than the men. Okay. So where do we see that? Because it says in the Torah regarding, that, regarding sorcerer, right? That he has to die. A person who does sorcery, he's liable to death. He's liable to death. But you know, when it talks about the sorcerer, it uses a female language. Mechashefa lo techaye. What does that mean? A sorceress. But why does it use the? Does, why doesn't use the male gender? Yeah, but there's good, there's, there's, there's good witches, and yeah. bad witches. There's white witches <laughs> and, and black witches, right? Okay. Am I right or wrong? No. Well, that's a different discussion. But the question is, why does it use the? Why does it use the? The uh, the female gender, not the male. You know why? Because most sorcerers are women. You know, probably like 90% who are, who are practicing these things are women. Why is that? Because they're closer to that side. You know, the side of evil. They're naturally more close to that. And their death is, and their death is burning? Or? And therefore they say, right, the, the Chazal tell us, by the way, something amazing. They say that there are all kinds of things in this world which are evil. You know, there's all kinds of evil, right? Mm-hmm. They say nothing is more evil than one thing. Mm-hmm. An evil woman, right? An evil woman is the most evil thing that there is. Oh, we get that song from evil women. Evil. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the biblical days, yeah. women were not allowed in court to testify. It's the same thing today. Nothing has changed. I'm talking about Jewish court, you know. Yeah. Same thing. There's a reason for it. Yeah, it's something, it's a little bit different there. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit different. They lie. Yeah, they lie. Yes, yes, they do, they do lie. But they, the truth is that the, the reason sisters, over there is a little bit different. The they usually sisters. lie from fear, you know, from, because they're scared. The two sisters that you said switched. Right, right. That that whole story there, whatever. But 
the, the point is like this, right? That women are, are closer to the evil side. What does that mean? That they're they're the ones who you know most most prostitutes are they male or female? Female, nowadays, right? Female. Now, nowadays, you know how it is, no, well, no, right? No, nowadays it's you, you can't compare. Believe me. Make make a go and see, right? Even today, right? Ninety percent of them are women. Okay. Most witches, most ninety percent of them are women, right? Except your friend, uh, except that guy. <laughs> besides, besides that guy, right? So besides him, they're all, usually they're all women. Why is that? Because they say, right, the Chazal. That yeah. most uh, the women are closer to the Yetzahara than men are, and this is, by the way, a good thing for the women. You know why? Because yeah. they say because of that they have to fight stronger against the Yetzahara than the man does. Their their struggle is bigger than ours. Why? Because since they're closer to that side, you know, they can just sh- display their body. You know, and what happens? You know, yeah. right? All 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 the havoc breaks, wreaks havoc to the world. Right? Just the fact that they're exposing themselves. You know, when a man, it's not like that. So what does that mean? But since women are, are like that, they're closer to Yetzirah, one thing is that they get rewarded greater. Why is that? Because they're fighting a bigger battle. You know? So if a woman is kosher regarding these things, that means that she's really kosher. You know why? Because if she can fight against this, the Yetzirah of the woman, that means she's really kosher. No question about it, right? They say, but since the women are closer to the Yetzirah than the men are, so therefore the biggest virtue that they have, you know what it is? It's newt, modesty. You know why? Because the, the Yetzirah of the woman is, is, is really associated most with her body. You know what I mean? That's, that's what it's all about. So therefore, in order to combat the Yetzirah of the woman, the most important uh, element there is to dress pitzenut, to dress modesty. You know? Once she does that, she has pretty much killed the Yetzirah of the woman. She's abolished it when she dresses nicely like that. She dresses modesty. So if a woman can do that, they say, right, that even if she has other sins than women, you know, because women have also other things that they do besides that, that they don't do properly. But they say that if she if she's modest, even though she has other sins, they forgive her for that. They give her a discount. <laughs> you understand? She gets a discount. Why is that? Because since she's taking care of the issue, the, the the main virtue of the woman, the main issue of the woman, which is modesty, since she's good with that, they, they, they say, you know what? Since you overcame this problem, which is the biggest problem by women, so the rest will give you like, you know, on a silver platter. We'll spoon feed you. You know, we'll give it to you, we'll give you a freebie. We'll give you a discount. Why is that? Because this is the this is the main problem of the, of the women. The, the, the modesty is the main issue. Yeah. So you go to the next right? world. Then you'll that, that's out. the idea, you know? So they say, right, if you see, that's the, why the Chazanish said, that if you see a woman who's modest, that means she's, she's a virtuous woman. She's righteous. Even though she may have other things that she does. But the fact that she takes care of this, which is the main issue of the woman, that makes her... It, it, it weighs, it outweighs the scales into the side of the righteous. An unbelievable thing, you know. This is the idea. So um, we we see over here, right, the crucial element of uh, of modesty by the women. By the man, it's something else, right? As we said, right, the man is not so beautiful. It's not his body is not so provocative like the woman, you know. So therefore, the issue of modesty by men is not really the central theme of Judaism. It is important. What does that mean? He can go outside, as we said, right, with shorts and a t-shirt. He's okay. But a woman going out like that is very provocative, you see. So, right, it's a, the, the two genders, when it comes to modesty, there's no correlation between them. Right? It's a totally different ballgame. Totally different issue there, right? So, um, if, we're gonna, if, we, if we already got into this issue of modesty with women, so we have to discuss one more thing, right, which is there is a controversy uh, regarding, you know, if a married woman is allowed to wear a, a wig, Instead of covering her hair with a with a, some kind of bandana or something, whatever you know, some kind of tickle, you know, they call it whatever kinds of things like this, right? Or with a hat, can she cover her hair with a wig? Is that considered to be a covering? You know, mm-hmm. that's the question, right? So the truth is, in the Ashkenazi world, the custom was by many women to wear wigs. You know, in Europe, that's the way it was. The truth is, you know, if you look into the poskim, even the Ashkenazi side, of the poskim, they say that this custom came from a bad place. What does that mean? That the you know these actresses used to wear these wigs, you know these, you know unchaste women, actresses and all kinds of you know things like this, who are you know usually not not so you know they're promiscuous these women, right? So the, the 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 custom to wear wigs came from a promiscuous source. So they want to say right some of the Ashkenazi poskim they want to say like that. The truth is right that if you look at the um, uh, 
the makeup of the the authorities that talk about this, the issue of wearing wigs, most of the authorities do not allow wigs to wear, to wear wigs. So therefore, the truth is that a woman who's married should not wear a wig uh, outside in, in the out, outdoor domain, out, outdoors, right? In the public domain, she should not. And there has been discussion at length about this, you know, amongst the poskim, back and forth, back and forth. But the truth is, you know, there's one thing you can say about it. It's very simple. You know, you know what the Mishnah says, right? It says that a woman is not allowed to wear, even if she, she wears one head covering and it covers the whole hair, she's still not considered to be modest until she puts a second covering on. Why is that? What's the reason why she needs a second one? Double covering. You know why? Because the custom was by women in those days, in those times, to put double covering. One and then on top, on top, of, the, on top of the other one. That's the way it was. So therefore, since the custom by women was like that, it's called dat yudit. It's called, right? It's the custom of the women to cover their hair like that. So therefore, it says the Mishnah that a woman is not considered to be modest until she covers her double covers. One covering and then another covering on top of it. So therefore, right, the, obviously you see from there that the custom, the custom of wearing a wig is really ridiculous. Why is that? Because to, nowadays the wigs, they look real. They look very beautiful. So the fact that you cover your hair with somebody else's hair, you know, what does that help you? You know, what, what did you gain by that, right? You took your hair, you covered it, and you covered it, you took somebody else's hair and put it on top. So what does that help you? The truth is, right, that there is one, one of the poskim, the Shutik Giborim, who wanted to make a differentiation. He wanted to say that hair which is attra- attached to the scalp is different than, than hair which is not attached to the scalp. But the truth is that he, what he was talking about is something else. He was talking about when they had wigs which were not so professionally made, because the wigs that are t- made today, they look like they're attached to the scalp, you know? They look, they look like they're attached. So therefore, right, the fact that they're, they, they, they're not really attached, actually, but they look attached. So you know, I think even, even the Shilta Giborim would admit in a case like that, that a woman is not allowed to wear a wig like that, because it looks absolutely real. This is why many Paskim, right, even nowadays, even the Ashkenazim, like Rabbi Yashiv, Rav Shlomo Zaman Ayubach, and many other Paskim, they said that today, nowadays, a woman is not allowed to wear a shaito, because these shaitos, they look very real. It looks like her real hair. It looks even better. So then what again? You cover your hair with hair. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that this is not good logic, you know? Very faulty logic. You're covering one per one hair and putting another hair. You know, like, I'll give you an example, right? What would that be comparable to? Let's say uh, right, uh, a woman uh, right, co- wants to cover her legs to be modest. You know, So she says, you know what? I'll put my other leg on top of it, so I'm covering my leg. But wait a second. I'm looking now at your, at your other leg. So what is happening that you covered your leg with another leg? Same thing, you know, when you cover your hair with hair, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand, right? There's no, there's no benefit to that. You don't have to be a big genius to understand that. A person who wants to permit these kind of things, you know, to be honest with you, I hate to say it, but it's, it's a very warped logic over there. <laughs> not, not really very logical. Even though there are some poskim, by the way, who did allow. And it's true, there are some poskim who did allow, but the vast majority of poskim is brought down in uh, the books of Moreno Ben Rabadi Roshalom. He brings down in his book, Yevi Omer, two different places over there, there's Chuvot and his responses, that brings down like 30 poskim over there, 30 authorities from all generations who did not allow, right, wearing wigs. So therefore the truth is that if a woman is really God-fearing, I don't care if she's Ashkenazi or Sephardi, whatever, I don't care what she is. If she's really a God-fearing woman, she should not wear a wig outdoors nowadays. And don't come and tell me, oh, there are some poskim who allowed and this and that, because this, for sure, in our generation, where the, looks, look very, the wigs look very real and beautiful, and they look oftentimes better than her real hair, so then what did you gain by putting a wig? You know, it's, it's an illusion. You're covering one leg with the other leg. So you now your leg is covered. Thanks a lot, you know. Oh, you know, very good. This is the logic of these rabbis, you know. They, they call themselves rabbis. I don't understand what kind of logic is this, if you, you, you say this kind of a thing. Covering one leg with another. So you're going to tell me, oh, this is the right leg. This is the left leg. What do I care if it's right leg, left leg? You know, what difference does it make to me? What do I care if, this is, if it's this lady's hair or somebody else's hair? What difference does it make? Or it's plastic hair, you know, synthetic hair. Those, the synthetic hair that they have today looks real. So what does it make a difference if it's synthetic, it's plastic, it's nylon, whatever whatever it is, right? It's all the same. They, every, all the, today, all the wigs look beautiful. They all look gorgeous, you know? So then what, is, what, is, what does it help you? So therefore, Rabbi, let's not go on with, with these delusions and illusions, right? A woman who marries, she has to cover her hair, not with a wig, right? She has to cover her hair. Not to cover hair with hair. <laughs> it's not a big. It's not a big. Uh, I'm not telling you a big novel idea over here. Right? I'm talking about simple, simple, plain old logic.
You know, that's that's, that's the idea. It, it's pretty it's pretty clear. You understand? So Hakadosh Baruch Hu should help us. Mr. Hashem said that we, we should all find. You know, the, you know, the Zohar Hakadosh says right regarding this. They say that uh, today in our world today, when we get married, a lot of people, a lot of these marriages that we have today, we're not really getting the proper zivug. We're not getting the proper soulmate for ourselves. We're getting the wrong person. You understand? So what does that mean? This is why the, today we have such a high rate of divorce and all kinds of things like this, right? Breakups and all kinds of things. You know why that is? Because today we're not often not we're not marrying the right woman. This is not the right woman for us. So what does that mean? The only reason we're marrying her is because we have some kind of tikkun to make with her, some kind of rectification. To have children with her, to bring some souls. From these two people are going to come some unique souls from them. You know? So you need to make this rectification. Akadosh Baruch wants to team you up with some lady to make some souls with her. That's from him. He wants that. So you're going along with that with that uh, will of will of God. But they say the true soulmate of the of the man is not going to come right like so early like this. It's going to come in times of Mashiach when Mashiach starts to come in that time. So then we're going everybody's going to get their true soulmate, the true woman that belongs with this person, you know. And then you're going to be really really happy, you know, because they say right that a person who's not married doesn't have sickness, doesn't have simcha, doesn't have joy. So if a person really wants to have simcha. He has to be with the right woman, not like women who you know give uh, you know these kinds of you know not not like these kind of girls. You know you know you know, for, for, you know what you get with that, right? You, you're not simcha. You get a heart attack. Right? You get a stroke with uh, like, that's, that's what you get. Unless someone is on your level, then God sends them the, 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 the that, right That's it, you know. But they say that the Zohar says that the real soulmate of the of the of the people is going to come during that time. Wow. They're going to get the real soulmate. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's an amazing thing, you know? Today, we're, many of us, or most of us, are not getting the real soulmate. It's like some kind of a sorry excuse for a soulmate. You understand? That's what it is. And that's why there's all kinds of problems. They're not getting along, right? Issues, fights, this and that. All kinds of squabbles. Blah, 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 blah. Going to rabbis, you know? Get, you know all kinds of things. <laughs> all kinds of things like that. So the true soulmate, and not only that, right? They say that when this time comes, that a person who's got his, his true soulmate, then it's going to be much more pleasurable and beautiful, the marriage. You know why? What is that going to be? After with that? Times of Mashiach. That's, that's the idea. You know? You may not make it to the time. You know, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you play your cards right, you'll make it, if you know what I mean, right? Play yeah, your yeah, cards right. Coming real soon. <laughs> play your cards right. So, you know, what do you mean to play your cards right? Do the mitzvot that you have to do, right? Torah mitzvot. That's the idea. That must be played for play the cards right. Yeah, but right? Isn't, the, isn't Mashiach coming... No, he's coming before the world ends. Yeah. Before the world ends. Yeah, end right, right, right. Before the before the end. Yes, yes. Before, and, and before the, the end of the world. Before the sun burns out. So what does that mean, Rabbi? What that means is that not only will the person get the true soulmate at that time, but Akadosh Baruch Hu is going to clean up. He's going to clean up the whole world. What does that mean? There are certain parts of the body now, the lower part of the body, right, which are imp- not pure. The lower part of the body of a person, right, the general area, is not pure today. It's considered to be like dirty, you know, filthy. But in those days, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to make even the lower part of the body clean, cleansed. He's going to cleanse all the whole body. So therefore, since the whole body is going to be cleansed, right, therefore, what's going to be is that you're going to enjoy having the right soulmate and a clean relationship, you know, without any dirty stuff, without any dirty ingredients over there. This is the idea. It's going to be utopia, you know, Gan Eden, the, the final, right, the, the ultimate... The ultimate um, state of marriage, the ultimate state of bliss, right? Being together with the right soulmate and having a pure body. So therefore, there's nothing dirty there. Everything is clean. You, remember the song? you understand? This is the idea. <laughs> okay. I want to bless you that you should see, get to the right soulmate. All to find the right soulmates. And then you're going to have real happiness. Amen. 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 Oh boy.